Hello and welcome to another edition of the Fatu Network News Review today, 14th November 2018. My name is Amar Wali. I have two guests with me here, Dr. Abja Baku as an Associate Professor of Mission and Practical... He's an Associate Professor of, mm -hmm. of Mission and Practical Theology at the Concordia Seminary in the United States. And I also have Dr. John Loom, who is the director of Ethnic Immigrants Institute of the same, is the same institute. So we'll be talking about uh, religion and many other things in this country, as well as uh, the Gambia Prison Services today graduated uh, the second batch of inmates who graduated, uh, got certificate in different areas, of interest, such as electrical installation, plumbing, tailoring, IT, and so on. And uh, the victims of 1994, November 11, have called on the Chief of Defense Staff of the Gambia Armed Forces to brought to justice those who participated in that uh, massacre. But before all that, I will start with the newspapers. As usual, the ICC explains the stance on JAME. And uh, official from the International Criminal Court, ICC, yesterday took questions from the Gambians and the international journalists attending the training of transitional justice on the court's work and the methods of investigation and intervention. The International Criminal Court often comes under criticism by African leaders and commentators for targeting only African leaders. But addressing these issues at Kairaba Beach Hotel yesterday, Mr. Amdiba, the head of International Cooperation at the Office of the Prosecutor, took up challenges from the Gambian journalists wanting to know why the ICC did not intervene in the Gambia at the height of the 2016 political upheaval and before that. And uh, according to Mr. Bach, um, he said, and I quote, we are very familiar with this comment, and I think it is important to again put them into proper perspective. The ICC has a procedure and very rigid processes that govern its in intervention, and in the case of the Gambia, the report received on the event here did not reach at the threshold to trigger ICC intervention, he told the journalists yesterday. He added that the crimes such as genocide did not happen in the Gambia, and uh, there was also no war crimes either since he has since this has not been any war in the country. Mm. And uh, Baro to receive and the African Golden Star Award, that is the President Adam Baro will on Tuesday receive the Security Watch Africa prestigious Golden Award for the exemplary national service in Africa for 2018. The award ceremony will take place in Banjul and uh, from November 13 to 16th and uh, during the 15th Africa Security Watch Award Conference that will ex an exhibition. The International Coordinator and the CEO of the Africa Security Watch Award Conference and the exhibition, Patrick Ayumobi, said the decision to decorate the president was taken after an assessment of his official and personal commitment to security and good governance in Africa. And uh, the standard is also reporting that four boys drowned at Fajara Beach. That is the uh, bodies of at least three teenage, teenagers boys have drowned at sea on Sunday evening off Fajara Beach where recovered yesterday morning. The body of the fourth boy was uncovered by the time they went to the press. One, of, one is from Banjul, while three others are from Manjai Kunda. And um, the NIA 9 trial, the state withdrew voluntary and cautionary exhibits. That is, the state prosecutor yesterday withdrew both cautionary and voluntary statement of Sheikh Omar Jeng, Babukar Sala, Tamba Masire, and Lamin Dabu in the trial of the former nine NIA officers. When the case was called, the late counsel Antumange informed the court that they wanted to withdraw the said statement. And uh, on the Point newspaper, the Point is reporting that uh, um, tourists arrested with cocaine, that is, um, operators of the Drug Law Enforcement Agency, the Gambia, have arrested a, jo a Jordan Walker, a British tourist currently in the country, with a suspected quantities of cocaine, the Point has been informed. The suspect is currently under detention of the narcotic officers and the investigation into the matter continues. The spokesperson for the Drug Law Enforcement Agency, Osman Sediba, confirmed the arrest and detention of the British national. Uh, the Speaker, Mariam Jack Denton, advocates for more females in cabinet and in parliament. That is the Speaker of the National Assembly of the Gambia, Mariam Jack Denton, urge, urges more women empowerment and said she would love to see more female in the cabinet 
and in the National Assembly. Madam Speaker made these remarks on Tuesday at the local hotel in an interview after delivering a speech at the two-day consensus building platform on women participation in international reforms in the Gambia. And uh, on the Foraya newspaper, Foraya also is reporting that journalists commence training on transitional justice and uh, international law. And they're also reporting that the Chinese, the new Chinese envoy arrives to strengthen ties with Banjo. On the Voice newspaper, the Voice is reporting that a German national commits suicide in Khartoum. That is a 42-year-old national has on Monday committed suicide in his home village of Khartoum, police have confirmed. In an interview with the police spokesperson ASP Lamin Jai confirmed the death of Omar Kinte, but added that the investigations are currently ongoing to ascertain the cause of his death. According to an eyewitness, the disease was found hanging on a kasu tree with a white rope tied on his neck. The Voice is also reporting that President Barrow to be awarded by Security Watch Africa and uh, well, viewers, that's all we have for you today on the papers. I will now turn to my guest, Dr. John Loom. She is the director of Ethnic Immigrant Institute of Theology at Concordia Seminary. And uh, I also have uh, Reverend Abja Baku, who is an associate professor of the same institution. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you very much. I understand that you has been in this country. You are a Gambian. He's from Syria, I know, but both of you are based in the United States. Yeah. Well, can you tell me why you are in this country? Well, there are two essential reasons. Uh, one is to enhance knowledge, and the other is to encourage the continued peaceful coexistence between people of other faiths. And so these are the reasons. And my brother, Dr. Baku, coming from the eastern side of Christendom, and uh, we Christians of the West, we're familiar with the teachings and uh, doctrines of the Western Dom. So we want him to contribute towards the uh, experience and knowledge of the Eastern Christianity and what we can learn from such. So. Uh, that's why we uh, graciously invited him, and he willingly and lovingly accepted the invitation. Okay, um, Reverend, you, you know you have spent at least a few days in this country. What has been your assessment of this the interfaith between the Christians and the Muslims? Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for inviting us here. It's uh, a great honor um, uh, to be here. As Dr. Lum mentioned, uh, I uh, just uh, started uh, my job at Concordia Seminary. I was teaching 11 years before at other college, Baylor University, teaching Arabic language and culture. But uh, since I got, uh, I accepted this position, Dr. Loom uh, was adamant of bringing me here and, uh, uh, and helping uh, uh, the Gambia. So, uh, and I, I, we came here, and uh, I was uh, uh, really impressed by the, uh, the atmosphere of uh, peaceful and uh, loving relationship between uh, the two faiths. Uh, he himself is coming from a family that is mixed. You have a Catholic, you have a Protestant, you have a Muslim also in the uh, same uh, family uh, living together and, uh, and working toward building uh, uh, this great nation, the Gambia. Uh, my first impression that uh, the country, uh, there is a huge potential or great potential for the country to grow. Mm -hmm. I know from what I heard that the country is in a transitional uh, political, social uh, period of, of the nation. And... Uh, and they are encouraging everybody to come and help build uh, this great uh, country. It's a beautiful, right on the beach, and uh, and it's 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 open to many uh, possibilities. And uh, it really encouraged me to come back again and uh, and help uh, uh, our brothers, Christian and Muslim, also to strengthen uh, 
the, the country and uh, the, the awareness of the need in the, uh, in the, in the Gambia. So uh, uh, first I was hesitant because we have many things to do in the United States to come here, but now I'm glad I did it. It's an eye-opener for me and I am uh, glad to be here in this great nation. Okay, uh, Dr. Loom, uh, Omi Andres is saying I am one of those family members of Dr. Loom. You are from a family that is mixed, like the um, professor said. Um, what can North African countries learn from the Gambia when it comes to coexistence between different religions? Well, um, it's been said many times, repeatedly, that Gambia is a symbol of mod uh, modality, and that modality is that uh, Christians and Muslims, and this is not just yesterday, it's historical, and ancient uh, is what our parents have given to us and we in turn are also encouraging and expanding on that. Now, so other countries need to watch the, the, the style of life that we have here, that you cannot be isolated. In the community, we embrace each other. You have diverse views, opinion, uh, religious inclination and association. So those areas, the gray areas that bring difficulty and misunderstanding should be set apart. It is what brings or join us or help to build a decent and conducive uh, nation and relationship that other nations can uh, copy from Gambia. For example, when we have festivity, yeah. uh, very often, uh, say Tobaski, for example, the uh, Muslim neighbors and brothers will cook and share their food with uh, their neighbors who may be Christian or non-Christian at all. And similarly, so when we Christians celebrate Christmas, in fact, I often tell people outside the Gambia that Christmas is far more celebrated and enjoyed by Muslims. Mm -hmm. And so that, uh, that interaction and sharing and participation in each other's festivity is a model which can be copied by other countries. You are like uh, Mr. Dr. Uh, uh, Lum here. You are also from Syria and you have touch on both Christians and Muslims. So in the Middle East, we have seen how divided they are. But what can the model the Gambia have here, what can other countries in the Middle East learn from the Gambia? Yeah, the, uh, when it comes to uh, religion, we always uh, say that uh, in Arabic we say that religion is for God and the nation uh, is for people. So we all live and share this land but then the religion it's your freedom, it's your personal relationship between you and your creator. And so we have to respect the decision, the religious decision that everybody makes. The issue is coming is when the religion is mixed, is fused with politics. And that's what, what we, the, that's what the term Islamist called. When we say Islamist, that means they mix the religion of Islam with politics also. And so that's, that's, that's the big uh, uh, issue uh, that, is, uh, that is happening all over uh, uh, the, the, the mm. Middle East. Yeah. These people want uh, they are religious and they want to control the political system also through a, a religious system. And, uh, and it has to be a separation between religion and state. That's what I notice here. I mean, it's the country, usually when the country is in a transition, you have a lot, a lot of religious tension. What I notice here that there is no religious uh, there is no religious tension between them and, and Gambia is very similar to the Middle East. The Christian community in the Middle East is small, is maybe around five percent. Some countries are maybe two percent also. Uh, uh, so but what I notice here despite this transition, people are are working together in a democratic way, uh, like Last week we were interviewed by the national TV okay. that they gave us one hour to talk about Christianity and they give the same thing to, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to Muslim. And so this, this, this is good because 
uh, when we talk about interfaith dialogue, we talk about tolerance, and, uh, and to be tolerant is to accept the other. And I think we have a good example of that. Yeah. Uh, Take, for instance, when there is a christening, um, a, a Muslim neighbor will, will uh, participate or be involved or visit. Similarly, so when there is a Christian, I know many years ago I was preaching in a church on a Christmas uh, day and some of our Muslim friends came. They want to receive the baraka, the blessing of God. In the Gambia, that's significant, and it goes on all the time. When there are funeral, Christians, Muslims will come and sympathize and even enter the church. Similarly, so when there is a Muslim funeral, the Christians will also go. So you see, religion binds us together. It's not meant to hate or to create tension. And uh, Gambia really, that's another model okay. that Gambia can export to uh, other countries. Well, um, when you talk about people, religion, in other countries, they don't have what you call religious tolerance. Mm. So how can a country have a religious tolerance? Well, it starts from the leaders. Um, the leaders should set the pace. Uh, and you have to understand, when you understand the religion, then you look for areas that... Uh, that combines or brings us together, things that we can celebrate together. Again, I, I refer, to, uh, reference this example of uh, festivity. It's one thing which I think other countries can copy uh, from the Gambia. So, but it goes with tolerance. Tolerance goes with understanding. When you understand, you know that you are not a custodian of all of knowledge whether it be secular or religious. So within that consumum of knowledge, you need to be tolerant. And, and Gambia, the African continent, I mean, we live by, side by side with so many different tribes and uh, that has different religious claims than, than the other, but we have been taught and trained to be tolerant. That is the, 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 the ethos of the African society and mentality. And I think the West need to learn that from the Gambia and yeah. from Africans. The reason, um, a couple of months ago, I, I submitted an article mm -hmm. to our Concordia journal entitled The Muslim Christian Encounter Challenges and Prospective. And one of the perspective I'm asking this question is religion the cause, the main cause of of intolerance or violence, and I'm saying yes and no. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it becomes, but again, the main cause is fanaticism and and uh, and rejecting the other. Uh, so that's the the main issue. It, it's it this this is this issue is also in political like Nazism, yeah. Stalinism. So if you if you are not like me, I crush you, I kill you. Yeah. And so it, it, if this spirit comes into religion. Then, then, then it becomes an issue of, of not accepting the other, not loving the other. In Christianity, we have something called the love of God. Uh, and, 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 uh, and the Bible uh, in the New Testament teaches us, he said, how can you cannot love God if you don't love your neighbor? Yeah. First of all, you have to show the love to your neighbor. If you don't love your neighbor, it, you, 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 you cannot say, and uh, you cannot say, um, I love God, because, because the love of God comes into your heart and fills you, and you love the other. Loving the other means I, I accept him, I mm -hmm. work with him, I, mm -hmm. I respect his, uh, uh, his indifferences. We know, mm -hmm. we recognize that there is uh, uh, deep theological mm -hmm. uh, differences between Islam and Christianity. That's fine. Mm -hmm. we, recognize these dif uh, we recognize these differences. But that if you are different that me, than me, that does not mean that I have to eliminate you. Yeah. And you see, uh, Africans, we have all these telling unique principles. For instance, the Africans, we emphasize relationship. Mm -hmm. From relationship, then you have the word tolerance and acceptance. So unless you know the other party, then you would be hesitant of that. But the core of the African culture is relationship. And 
with relationship goes community. So I, I, I mean, Africa just has all the model, uh, the great model that brings people of diverse concepts and understanding together. Yeah. So we start with relationship building. Okay, um, I know you are both religious leaders and we have plenty of them in this country, but in as much as you have peace, you want to know each other peace. So what should be the role of religious leaders, those who do sermons and preachings and so on? Well, uh, years ago in the early 80s, um, I worked with a group called Parachurch Organization called Islam in Africa Project. Mm -hmm. And through the Christian Council, we established the interfaith uh, dialogue. And uh, that was really meant to bring the religious leaders together to understand, to uh, work together. So religious leaders mm -hmm. have a key role in every society, in every community, mm -hmm. to teach tolerance and acceptance. So I would say that the role, principally, the role of the religious leader is to know how to communicate. Weigh your words, mm -hmm. you have to be sensitive to, as you express, because what you know, the other party may not know, and how we resist it can be different. So measure your words, your expression, so that it is not expressed in a way that could bring annoyance or misunderstanding. So the religious leaders, the imams, the reverends, the bishop, should always gird how they express themselves so that uh, it will carry a tune of understanding. There is always uh, uh, there is a, um, a a beautiful verse uh, in the Bible. It's very practical for both Muslim and Christian. It's it's always encouraging us speaking the truth in love. Yeah. Augustine from the fourth century he said, "Love first, and then do whatever you want." So uh, uh, love start by by loving our neighbor. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all say there is no God, la ilaha illallah, there is no God but God. So our relationship with God, the love, when we look at God, the, the, the way we, we express God, when we see God, God, the God of love, then that, that love by itself, loving our neighbor, that, that relationship of loving and peaceful relationship by itself kills, kills the uh, extremism, fanaticism, and fundamentalism, that by itself. Dr. Loom, um, I've kept you for some time now. I will finally, what will be your final message? Well, um, I thank uh, the Gambian community, the leaders, and the elders. Uh, we've spoken to many uh, groups and uh, people, and they've accepted us very graciously. So my final comment would be that this kind of model of relationship, peaceful, coexistence, acceptance, and tolerating others whose ideas maybe differ from yours, but be patient and accept so that we can all live in this beautiful Gambia. We call this country the Smiling mm, course, Coast. Yes. We're smiling people, we're very <laughs> hospitable. I right. mean, we've not had lunch really oh, from uh, from where we stayed. Okay. We've been eating from one house to the other, yeah. my in-laws and others. Last night we have a delicious meal yeah. uh, by somebody whom we know. So that graciousness and acceptance would be my final comment that the religious leaders should teach this in their mosque, in their masjid, in their churches, in the place of worship. Continue to live in peace and harmony so that God will continue to bless this country. And we pray for the leaders, the political leaders. We pray for uh, uh, the President Barrow and his cabinet and his ministers. I, I love, we love this country, it is us. I, I don't have a, a second country, even though I'm a Gambian American, but I love this country. That's why I bring people, that's why I bring a lot of stuff so that all of us can enjoy. We only have one country and we pray that God will bless this country, the leaders, the president, and all our children, especially the women too. We must embrace the women and uh, help them to be very uh, productive.
So thank you and God bless the Reverend, Gambia. Reverend, finally. Okay, I'm really, uh, again, when I came here, I was hesitant. And, uh, and many people say you're going to go to a country of uh, majority Muslim, you're going to be careful, etc., etc. But now I feel very secure and uh, I am happy to be here. And uh, I saw the thirst for everybody to learn. We did more than workshop with different groups. Tomorrow we will be speaking at the university. We spoke at the TV and we saw that Muslim, Christian, all of them are calling us, asking questions. They are thirsty to learn and grow and build this country. And, uh, and that's, that, that encouraged me uh, uh, to maybe next, next year we'll come back and, and do more, more and build more and, and interact. Uh, uh, and and the country, if the country continue in this way, you will see a great country. In the in the future, so I'm glad to be here and uh, and thank you for Dr. Loom who uh, mm -hmm. was insistent on bringing me here uh, with him. Thank Smiling you. Smiling, of the Gambia. <laughs> Viewers, that is uh, Dr. Uh, John Loom. He's a Gambian American. Uh, he works at the at the Mission for Political and Theology at the. Concordia Seminary. You know, when I say Concordia, my mind goes to the Italian ship that capsized. Costa Concordia. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Reverend Abja Baku. Baku. Thank you so much for your yeah. time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the viewers will move on. The Gambia Prison Services, in collaboration with the Inside Training Center, uh, today graduated the second batch of inmates in electrical, in electrical installation, plumbing, tailoring, and our information technology. Um, Mami Sedekan was there and uh, let's take a listen to that report. Replace your 3G SIM card today for the real office of 4G SIM and receive one gigabyte of internet data for free. We gathered here today to celebrate another milestone in the history of the Gabia patients. To witness Another graduation of 43 well-trained and composed inmates in various disciplines of skills training. This cannot be fulfilled without the advent of institutions and partners to help in these reformation processes in skills training as a tool to help inmates who became assets in their community upon their release. The new era of dispensation is a dynamics as to keep as to set key priorities in reformation, where our engagements are to make sure that the minimum rules of international correctional practices are respected, adhered and fulfilled to help treat inmates in holistic and respectful manner to shift human security. Correction centers are meant to be a drive to reform, transform the wrongs that individuals have committed, either by purpose or circumstances. The respect for the rule of law, no to any form of human inhuman treatment with impunity, advocate for free, fair, and speedy trial for an effective justice to be served to avoid disturbances, which will be the key priorities as we owe the people we are giving service to meet the best standard in international correctional practices. 43 inmates will be receiving their certificates today in the following field of studies. Electrical installation 19, plumbing 10, tailoring 4, and information technology 10. In addition to their field of studies, they have also been trained in English communication, entrepreneurship, information technology, and good morals. To the graduates, this marks the starting of a new page. Please jealously make use of this opportunity, and you will be an asset to your families community and, uh, and the state at large. We will continue to celebrate the time you took to be accorded this merit today. South Africa Global is pleased to launch Dalaba Housing Estate. Dalaba Housing Estate is our newest estate located on the Sukuta Jabang Road. You can buy a finished two or three bedroom house or service plots accompanied with a free fence and gate. At Dalaba Housing Estate, you get to enjoy bituminized roads, gated and fenced properties, solar street lights, water reticulation, public amenities, 1,500 fruit trees aligned in streets and many more. Make a 40% down payment today and spread balance conveniently for 10 years with GD Bank, Echo Bank and Trust Bank. TuffAfricaHomes.com
Tough Africa Global. Our experience is global. Our focus is Africa. Welcome back. Um, um, that was a story prepared by Mami Sedikan and the graduation the of Af inmates, the second batch of inmates at Mile 2 Central Prison. Now, Mami is here with me. Mami, welcome. I think this is your Thank fourth you. time. Yes. So you tell me, how was the mood like at the, at the, mile, at the graduation ceremony today? Yeah, um, as you mentioned, um, I was there today, uh, the graduation of inmates uh, who were graduated from Inside Trading Center in different uh, field of study. Uh, the mood there was emotional because these are uh, convicted people who, who, who spend uh, most of the, 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 the years in prison. Yeah. And then seeing their families um, coming there to, to congratulate them on this, uh, term, term, uh, on this uh, good job that they have done mm -hmm. through going, uh, uh, graduating from these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, field of different field of studies, and also there was a, a, a portrait that was very emotional. There, one of the inmates uh, mm -hmm. who studied electrical uh, installation, and also was showing some of the practices that they were um, taught in class, which was very emotional. Some people were there, and then they were taking pictures with their families and friends. So it means that the, now the prison condition with the help support of the Gambia. The, the inside training center now, they come exactly. out of the prison, they will have skills. Exactly. And this is the second batch, okay. and they graduated about 43 uh, uh, inmates, uh, including one uh, prison service okay. officer. Uh, so they are urging like next time so that they can involve a lot of uh, prison service officers also so that they can be part of the initiative. All right. Thank you so much, Mami, for your time. You're welcome. Well, viewers, that is Mami Serikan. There she was at the graduation today. Now, uh, today also the Victim Center held a press conference where the victims and survivors of the April, November 11, 1994 are calling on the Chief of Defense Staff of the Gambia Armed Forces, Lieutenant General Masani Kinte, to bring to justice the alleged perpetrators of that massacre. You may remember on that day, 1994, some military officers were accused of uh, plotting a school against former president and uh, the alleged ringleader was Basil Barrow and several others who were allegedly summary executed at the Yundum Barracks. Well, um, have a one, we at the press conference, uh, Ablai J. Dabo, who was a lance corporal of the Gambia Armed Forces at the time, uh, he has this message for the Gambians. When shall we have the judgment? When shall we be given the verdict? Today marks 24 years of hardships, sorrow, lost families. Today is the day when Gambians were paraded They were paraded and soldiers standing behind them, counting after three, started shooting them. November 11 is the most serious and the most major serious crime committed in Gambia in the history. November 11, we shall never forget, and we shall never forgive. November 11, we were arrested, tortured, killed, detained, sentenced unwrongfully without a proper judicial system. And we need judicial system. We need it to, to be held. And how can we be held? We can't. We tried. But still, there is no answer to our call. November 11 is the day. That we shall never forgive. And those who were doing such are still 
walking in the streets with guns, uniforms, and other things. How will we see ourselves in this society? We the victims. Those who commit crimes are still flying over our heads. We the victims, where can we go? And where to go? And how to go? I was arrested together with the late Lieutenant Basiru Baro there. The late Lieutenant Dotfal. Ba. Lieutenant Dabo, Say, and others who were brutally killed by the military junta. Under no circumstance. We have a, a, a minor dispute between us, and they changed those things to a military coup. Started killing people wrongly, arresting people in their homes, direct from there kill them. Some were innocent, and they received serious injuries, tortured, some even lost their lives. The day we were arrested, we were taken to mile two at that very night. After some minutes, we were collected from mile two to Fajara Barracks, where we were paraded, started killing us. After the count of three, you just had the weapons all over your body. This house soldiers started dropping down. After seven o'clock in the morning, when they said now every people can see each other, now we were transported back to Yundu. Barracks, where another soldier came into the vehicle and just looked at us. He stepped on my chest like this. He was just seeing the vehicle and said, oh, these people are not there. Give me the gun. They give him the gun again. Started killing, completing those people. Later on, I was told, to dig my own grave to be buried alive. Because the person in charge was calling me in law, my in law, because he's, he married to my nephew, my niece. That's why he called me in my in law. If the gun cannot kill you, I'll bury you alive. Bring out the state and pick us for me to dig my own graveyard. But I thank Allah, who spared me. To be a witness today for the entire Gambians and the victims. These people behind me were sentenced for nine years wrongfully without proper judgment. And we are urging this new government to urgently assist us through the help of the victim center that we need verdict. Our voice needs to be heard. It's hard to say, but let's just take that it goes. Because the person who stood on my case killed my friends. And every time I'm seeing him in uniform, passing by, we prayed in the same house. At times, when I see what comes to my mind is, let me die and once and for all. But I said no. The Allah who spared me, one day will join. Without wasting time, let me give chance for the others if they may have anything to share. Thank you all. Well, viewers, that was um, Lance Corporal Ablai J. Dabo there. He was um, reminiscing the incident of November 11, 1994, where the 
it was alleged that 14 military personnel were executed at the Yundum barracks and scores were kept under detention for 10 years with hard labor. Now they are calling on the head of the military to bring those perpetrators or alleged perpetrators to justice for their involvement in that uh, crime. And uh, at the same event, the wife of the late uh, Lieutenant Basiru Baro, who is said to be the ringleader of that uh, counter coup, was according to them, was also delivered a statement and has also called on the government to look into their matters, we understand. And according to witnesses, they, uh, Basiru Baro was buried alive. So let's take a listen to Basiru Baro's wife, Sunkari Yabo. Nibin <laughs> Kumboto Cabin Bolum for B. Ah, Sangi morning, Fulanga be Kumbo. For Nia for Mang Betta and Nia Mang Betta, for Yena for Abbe Opera, Opera. Was Mang Kumbotel and Massa Mosso Selem found Assis Lanyame, so could not deny Finch the Bandakata restaurant oil, local restaurant Kaele, Ganin Dimbal to put dying in the jail. I call it a backy, 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 backy. So we need to be. We find that Ben Fang Express can be for us. We have to be careful. Ah, we have to be careful. 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 Be that was Sunkari Yabo there, the wife of late Lieutenant Basiru Baro, uh, who was said to have been executed or killed in, on the 11th of November 1994 at the Union Barracks. She said she was 25 years old at the time and now 37 and uh, said it was a difficult moment for her and she had to endure to brought up three kids when her husband was allegedly killed by the former regime. And another survivor of the incident, Kairaba Kamara, also said this, what happened on that day. Let's take a listen to Kairaba Kamara. He is a man with experience, and all these things that happened so far, he must have the claw of it. If he said he didn't have the claw of it, I would say no to it. I care about it, I would say no to it. My son knows me very well. He is from 16 Intec. I am from 1st Intec Gambia National Army. That was 1984. Then, after finishing my five years in the Gambia National Army, I remember the engagement was in 1990, 1991. That was the time they started their That was the 16th intake. I did, this, I did the intake with them because then, during our training, we were doing guerrilla warfare. And then the, the, the system has, has changed to now Dibia, Dibua and Fibua. There's, there's fighting in build up areas and the defense in build up areas which I'm supposed to do to be a competent soldier. This is why I joined with them. I'm supposed to have two weeks with them at Farafenye. Instead, they said no. They want the intake, the 60 intake to be good. This is why I was detained for them to have a good uh, trainee. This is why I was with them. 
I, I, so if he said he doesn't know, I will say notary. He knows it. How many of them? I cannot tell you all that I know because some has happened. What has happened during my time? This is what I can say. November 11. Yes, yeah, some those who participated. Uh, I can name you one who can tell you all. Oh, oh if you don't mind, I, if you touch me, I'll say. If you touch me, I'll say. Me, I don't fear nothing. At the moment, I don't fear nothing. If you touch me, I'll say. So it's better you don't touch me there. If you uh, let's go sit there. It is me, Kairaba, who is talking. I want the whole world to hear what I'm saying. It's me, Kairaba Kamar, who is speaking. No name, just numbers. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much uh, for. Um, well, viewers, that was um, Kairaba Kamar, a survivor of the November 11, 1994 massacre, and uh, he called on the Chief of Defense Staff of the Gambia Armed Forces to look into their plight and bring to justice those military officers who participated in that alleged massacre to justice. And he said they are still serving in the military and uh, most of them are working freely on the streets. And they said they want those people to be brought to justice. Viewers, that's all we have for you today. From me, Amal Wali, and my team, we thank you all for your time. Till tomorrow. Bye for now.